Sunday is that special time for us to get together and study the Word of God. We're so glad that you've joined us this morning for our presentation of Give Me the Bible. So go get your Bible, sit down, and let's study together from the pages of God's eternal Word right here on Give Me the Bible. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Jesus said, a kingdom that is divided against itself cannot stand. You know, we live in a religious world today that says it really doesn't make any difference what you believe as long as there is a, a, even a minute degree of sincerity in your heart. Now, that's easy for people to believe and to assume. And I say assume because that really is not what God teaches. Now, if that intrigues you, I hope you'll stay tuned this morning right here for Give Me the Bible. I'm Dan Manuel, and I'll be your host today. And uh, we have a number of panelists that are going to be addressing this subject. Is Christ divided? Is he? You know, if the kingdom is divided, then you must say that Christ is divided as well. But certainly that's not in keeping with the will of God. We're asked for the scout uh, bets today from over the Angelina Church of Christ in Lufkin, Texas, to help us understand why Christ is not divided. Good morning. Certainly as we think about the, the structure of society, they think that we can all get along for the sake of unity, and they call that unity, but they look at it in such a, a strange way that the Bible does not present it as. Jesus himself is going to say in John 17, verses 1 through 5, <clears throat> that he and the Father are one. He's going to continue that throughout the chapter of, of chapter 17. He says, glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. And now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory that I had with you before the world was. John 17, verse number 5. Jesus is God. They are one and the same. They have the same mission because they are one. The scriptures are going to draw the reader's mind to unity in the New Testament. Biblical unity, though, that's important. Because the world says unity at all costs. Tolerance. We can all just get along. We're, we're all in the same way, or we're all going to heaven just taking different paths. The Bible says, though, unity at the cost of Christ. He's the one who purchased the church. How are we to come to that unity of faith that's mentioned in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 13 unless we are all reading the same thing and understanding it the same way? It's through the scriptures that we're going to find that unity. Romans chapter 12, verse number 16 is going to talk about that. Romans chapter 15, verses 5 and 6 will discuss that. They all come together in him because he is God and God is him. Jew and Gentile alike, they're going to come to him. We look at Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, this prefacing of a, a prophecy there of a future unified body of believers. They're also, as we look at this being one in Christ, undivided, we're bearing the identifying marks of a Christian. We have love, as it was going to be spoken of in John 13, verses 34 through 35. Those are the characteristics of a Christian. By this, you will know if you're, they were, by this they will know if you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Their manner of life is going to be different. They're going to proclaim both the Father and the Son, so that they may believe that you sent me. Jesus says, just as we are one, John 17, verse number 22. Is Christ divided? He is not. And we rejoice in that fact because we can be united with Christ, who will then present us to the Father in the day of judgment. Back to you, Dan. Well, thank you, Scout. You know, Jesus, in talking about the way to heaven, says that the way is straight. Narrow is the gate that leads to life eternal. And it is a one-way street, isn't it? Surely it is. It doesn't have any bends or curves in the road, or you can't come in from the south or the west or the east. We're going to go the way that God has asked us to go, and that is the right way. We're going to ask Brother Perry Cowan now as we continue discussing this subject 
uh, you know, is Christ divided? You know, Perry, when I read that book of John 17, and, and obviously a scout alluded to it there a moment ago, we not only should see the unity of the body of Christ, but shouldn't we see the unity of the Godhead itself? Are they not one, and how are they one? Are they just one in purpose? Uh, or is God the same person as Jesus? Could you explain all of that to our audience this morning? Then I'd be happy to explain that. I wish I understood it. Now, it's, it's something that's really exciting to learn when you discover that God is one in three persons. There's God the Father, there's God the Son, there's God the Holy Spirit, yet there is but one God. Moses said, speaking of God, the Lord our God is one. God in the beginning when he created man said, let us create man in our image. So there was a multiplicity of uh, beings there, but they were one uh, because they were God. God is one. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now the Bible uh, mentions all three of them in the same passage on different occasions, such as Matthew chapter 3. Uh, Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened to him, and uh, he saw the Spirit of God, there's one, the Spirit, descending like a dove and lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven, that was the voice of God the Father, and that voice said, this is my beloved son, there's God the Son, uh, in whom I am well pleased. He, he did that again at the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17. Uh, in Matthew 28, Jesus said, go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, we, we need to understand the oneness of God. Let me see if I can maybe illustrate that a little bit uh, with this. I'm, I'm sure all of you recognize uh, this fruit is, is an apple. We call it an apple because that's what uh, the name Adam gave to it uh, back in the beginning. Well, the, the uh, apple, I've, I've only got one apple here, but it's got different parts, and each part of it has a particular function. There's a peeling that covers the outside of it. The peeling is to protect it. That represents God the Father. He is our protector. He is our creator and, and our keeper. Uh, but if we look on the inside of the apple, you will find that there is flesh. There's a meat, we might call it. Uh, and it's, it's to provide nourishment. It's for a food to, to uh, build us up. Uh, this is like the Holy Spirit. The Spirit provides us nourishment from the Word of God. And then if you look on the inside of the apple, I don't know if you can see that or not, but there is a dark spot in there. That's a seed. Well, the seed is the Word of God. Now, you'll find many uh, televangelists uh, teaching today, send in your seed. Or what they want you to do is send $900 or something like that. But the Bible says the seed is the Word of God. That's what we need to understand. There's three parts to this apple, but it's still just one apple. Dan? Well, thank you, Perry. It's not so much really uh, how many apples there are, but how many or how many seeds there are, but how many apples are in one seed. Think about that. And Luke chapter 8 says that the Word of God is the seed. Brother Joe Hancock, we want you to go further in explaining unto us how Christ cannot be divided. Why would that be an impossibility in today's religious world, even though many teach different and contrary to that? Well, Dan, you're right. There, there are lots of different quote-unquote religions in the United States and, and hundreds of thousands all over the world. And for that, for them all to be true religions, especially the ones devoted to God, to Christianity, to, to Christ, if they're teaching something all different, then that means Christ would be divided in his teaching for them to all be correct in what they teach. I hope that makes sense because, as we know, denominations are uh, all teaching something different in, in their doctrine, 
in one manner or another about one topic or another. But the, the thing is, Dan, if, if the scriptures are truth, and, and Jesus is called in, in John 17, 17, called God's word truth. Your word is truth. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. And that being the case, uh, we need to be guided by the scriptures. You, the scriptures will direct our steps in ways that God intended for to be for the best of us, the best of, of, of our, uh, our our nature, that we could follow His words to get where we need to be, in the end result into heaven. Uh, the church is not divided. There are denominations out there in the world, but the church, the church of the New Testament, is not divided. The church is unified. The church speaks in the New Testament. It's speaking of the church. The church is spoken of in a unity fashion. Uh, even the faith that we enjoy, the faith we share is spoken of in singular. Uh, faith can be one of two definitions. Faith can be a belief system or faith can be a, a trust or uh, understanding of truth. But the belief system we call the faith is spoken of as singular in the New Testament. Look at uh, Acts 6 and verse 7. Uh, many priests were obedient to the faith, the faith. Acts 13, verse 8, Eliamus tried to turn the proconsul away from the faith. And then where we find the faith, and every time the faith, the, the belief system is spoken of, it's spoken of in singular form, the faith. And where we find that faith, as Paul said, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's through the word that God has given us as a direction in the best best possible way we live our lives. So go to the source. Don't believe men. Believe God's word and trust the scriptures. They'll lead you in the absolute right direction. Dan? Joe, just as the Bible says there in the book of Ephesians uh, chapter 4 that there is one faith we know that according to the Bible, there is also one baptism. You know, you hear a lot of people that they talk about baptism and they talk about sometimes they were baptized when they were children. And uh, what they mean by that is they were sprinkled or they were christened maybe in some religious group. Uh, water poured on their head. It was against their will to begin with. It certainly was not a willful thing. And yet the Bible says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So we need to know why we're being baptized. Now, uh, the one baptism is mentioned by Paul here to help us understand that it is exclusive. We're going to ask Brother Marty Nash right now. Marty, tell us a little bit about this one baptism and what it really means. And how is one baptized? Thank you, Dan. The one baptism. The English word baptize derives its origin from the Greek word baptizo. And it means to dip, bury, plant, to cover out of sight, to immerse. Let's see how baptism is described in the scriptures. Look at 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21. And it reads, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was appearing, wherein few, that is eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure wherein too, even baptism, doth now also save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We also see that baptism is a burial. It's seen in Romans 6 and 4 and also Colossians 2 and 12. We see that baptism is a resurrection. Also seen in Romans 6, 4 and 5. And as we saw in Peter, 1 Peter 3 and 21, an immersion is a cleansing bath. What does it cleanse us of? Our sin, our sin. Without baptism, there can be no remission of sin. As seen in Acts 3 and 28, 
In baptism, we put on Christ Jesus. But you think about something for a moment. In Matthew 28 and 19, Jesus gave a command to his disciples before he ascended into heaven. Go ye therefore unto all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The only command given by Christ in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Well, Marty, you're precisely correct. It is the only command given in the name of uh, Jesus Christ. He is the one that has all authority. And uh, that we are to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. And if you've not experienced that, it is something you ought to consider immediately. Your soul hangs in the balance. Brother Barry Haynes, uh, we're going to ask you this morning, we've been talking about various things, the one, one faith to prove that Christ is not divided, uh, the one baptism, as Marty has addressed there, uh, and, and numerous other things. Uh, we want you to go a little bit further here, Barry, in helping us understand that Christ is not divided. Why? <laughs> you know, we see with Christ that there is a body of Christ, and that body represents the church. You know, sometimes you'll hear people say, there is only one body, but there are many churches. But the scriptures teach that the church and the body are, are the same thing. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18 says, Christ is the head of the body of the church. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 22 and 23, he is the head over all things to the church, which is his body. The body is the most used comparison for the church in the scripture. We see it in uh, uh, Romans chapter 12 when it talks about the, the body of Christ being like a human body, that it has many parts, as just as our bodies have arms, legs, livers, hearts, all these different parts. They all work together for the function of the one body, and it is under the headship of Christ. And that helps us to understand that Christ cannot be divided because he does not have many bodies. He has one body one head and one body. And that unity is essential in the body of Christ. You can't have a body that functions properly if it's getting multiple signals from multiple different places. It has to have one head. And that one head has to follow into that one body. I remember years ago I read about Abraham Lincoln and while he knew his office, he ran a country that was a democracy, he knew his office was not one. In one of his very contentious meetings, his cabinet was voting for it, and at the end of it, he, he called for a vote. And he's read the results. He said there are seven, a, or seven nays and one A, and the A's have it because he was the one A. He was the one that said uh, he was the one in charge, and it didn't matter what everyone else said. He was the president, and that's the way it went. And the same thing is true for the church. The head is the one that determines everything. It doesn't matter what all the body parts are doing if they're not under the headship. We, we've seen that with people that have maybe a tragic accident where the, the signals from their brain don't get to their body or a disease causes those signals to, to malfunction and how their body becomes useless. They can't walk, they can't function because they're not connected to the head. The same thing is true for the one body. The one body, his church, must be connected to that one head. If Christ is divided, then the body will never function because it's getting too many different signals. For the body to be healthy and to do what it's supposed to do, it has to have that one connection to an undivided Christ, to a singular body. Well, Barry, thank you. Uh, in explaining that, we certainly can grasp the idea that Christ is not divided that we can't follow different patterns out there somewhere and think that we're following the blueprint of God. Any of you ever watched Judge Judy? <laughs> you know, Judge Judy says in her advertisements on television that the only opinion that really counts is Judge Judy's. That's a little delusional, isn't it? Uh, certainly it is when it comes to spiritual matters. The only opinion that really matters is not yours, mine, nor the next fellow's, but it's what God says. And when God addresses a subject, that's the way it is. And as Brother Walter Cronkite used to say many, many years ago, and that's the way it is. <laughs> well, we're going to ask Brother Jerry Munholland to tell us even further about the way it is and why Christ is not divided uh, based upon the great hope that we have. And there's only one. Isn't that right, Jerry? Absolutely, Dan. <clears throat> if you're reading Ephesians chapter 4, uh, beginning in uh, the 
first few verses, we have the oneness, the seven ones of Christ, and Christ is not divided in this. And I'll talk about that one hope of our calling. As we talk about that one hope, that singleness of hope that we have, uh, Peter talks about this in 1 Peter. I want to read this. If you turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, he said, uh, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Our hope, he said, it's a constant living hope. It's not a dead hope. There's something that he's, he's given us, as, uh, as Webster describes, hope as a confident expectation. It, it's just knowing, our hope, knowing that Christ has been raised, risen from the dead. And his resurrection gives us hope that we too shall be raised from the dead. In fact, Paul would talk about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he, he would say, for in this life only we have hope. Then we are all men most miserable. He said that in verse 19 of 1 Corinthians 15. And see, it's not just in this life that we have hope, though we have hope in this life. It is a living hope, constant hope that we have through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he continues to say, but now if Christ is risen from the dead, he has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. I see three things about our hope here. Number one, that confident expectation. It is knowing that we have this hope. Uh, this is provided us from, from God. Because Jesus rose from the grave, we know that we too shall rise from the grave. And then we see the trust in our hope. Our hope is not in, based upon us, but it's based upon God who raised Jesus from the dead. And that great trust and faithfulness that if he raised Jesus from the dead, he'll raise us from the dead. And then also we have patience with our hope. It will not be fulfilled today, maybe, but we look forward to that great hope that we have sometime in the future when Jesus comes again. Now back to you, Dan. Well, Brother Jerry, thank you so much for providing for us that information about hope. I want to go just a little step further here, and I want Brother Chris Groda, uh, if he would, to help us realize uh, just where that hope comes from. Uh, Chris, I know that people can have false hope. Uh, they're given hope sometimes when there is no hope. But what, uh, you know, what's the difference there, and where do we really get this hope? That's a great question, Dan. And you know, Hebrews chapter 6, verses 18 and 19 points us right to Jesus. We have as an anchor for the soul, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who has gone into the holiest, that is the most holy place, and has atoned for our sins there. His blood, the veil of his flesh, has been uh, the go-between between us and God and gives us great access. So we have the wonderful uh, uh, the promise of hope th because of the grounds that were laid by Jesus Christ, and he is the guarantee of our hope. Now, we sing so many times, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. But I want to tell you that there, there are some other things that we must take into consideration this morning in connection to that. And when you're thinking about the mechanics of salvation and this great hope that we have, Understand this, in Ephesians 2 and verse 8, we are saved by grace through faith. It is His goodness and His, His mercy, Titus 3 and verse number 5, that He has saved us. The blood of Jesus Christ, Ephesians or Romans 5 and verse number 9, justifies us. Romans 1 verse 16, the message of the gospel is the power of God to save. Of course, you take all of that and you couple it with the sinner's faith, Acts 16, 31. Uh, our repentance, Luke 13, 3. Our confession that Jesus is the Christ, Romans 10, 9, and 10. And our baptism into Christ is actually a baptism into his body. It's a baptism into his death. And we also put on Christ simultaneously. And that's why Peter says in 1 Peter 3, 21, that baptism doth also now save us. And we arise to walk in the newness of life with our working faith. James 2, 24, we have that hope then that we've been talking about Romans 8 24 where Paul says for we are saved in this hope but hope that is seen is not hope 
for why does one still hope for what he sees? My friends, we build our salvation on the promises of a God who cannot lie. Back to you, Brother Dan. And what great hope we actually have, Chris. Thank you so much for your timely words. And thank all of our panelists today. You've done an excellent job in the presentation of the Word of God to help us understand that Christ is not divided. But understand that Christ expects us all to follow His eternal Word. We pray that you would join us uh, for our presentation of Give Me the Bible next week. Uh, we have a very interesting program. You don't want to miss that one. And uh, if we can be of help to you in any way in helping you understand more fully the will of God for your life, or if we could baptize you into Christ, please give us a call. I'm Dan Manuel. I've been your host today. May God richly bless you until we present another Give Me the Bible. Sing the sweetest song of all.